Kapula, asimanyi uh, okwezo kunyambe simu ya ngeena, ya jira mkusoka mwale mjibi whatsapp, nga we data we, katukese nizo receiving nga fairo wa waka, nga njaga lo gendo wa mufila wa kufairo, eri wa mufairo manager, nga mulaba ni ye, jibi whatsapp kastanji ya mune teka mwene whatsapp. Mifakti wenyenda yu, ni ye kuri yeti ngira yu folder ya whatsapp, ni wakata genda yu. Katikuwa asimse waka, njaga lo mjie
Uh, hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I have delayed by a quarter of an hour. I hope that wasn't uh, so much concern. I usually give it a few minutes to make sure that everybody has come in, uh, but it won't always be uh, 15 minutes, it will probably be uh, five minutes. Uh, I'm called Edwin Mugume. I'm going to be taking you through uh, introduction uh, to digital electronics. Uh, please, you can let me know if you can hear me clearly. Just text, uh, you can use the chat. Um, we are going to be using Zoom for now. We are likely to use Zoom uh, for most of, okay, thank you. Uh, we are likely to use Zoom for most of um, 
the semester, even when we open campus, uh, we are likely to continue with Zoom for some time or specific lectures as and when I feel it is appropriate. Um, so because we are going to be using Zoom, I need to go through a few uh, yeah, bits of etiquette that we are going to be following. Now I know that Zoom is not new to you and uh, you have been using it, but I still need to tell, tell, tell you a few things that I mind about. Many things I probably don't, uh, but some things I do mind. Number one, you should try and use your full name uh, when you uh, when you join. So for instance, here I see somebody called Semaganda Ramon. I see Kisa Leon Dennis. All these are great. I see Maria, um, you know, Maria probably uh, you need to add your other name. Then other people use, uh, other people use things that I don't understand. Other people use phone names and whatever. Please try and use your full names so that I know who uh, is in. Two, um, I'll be, the other thing that you need to do is basically keep your video off. It's not necessary uh, for me to look what, as you'll notice, even I will be removing my video. So you can keep your video off because in the past students have put their videos and have uh, seen situations that I don't, I would prefer not to see. So I think it is good for everyone. Three, always be un, uh, uh, muted. Please mute yourself. We don't like to hear the background noise. And then you can unmute when you want to ask a question or you want to, to talk. Um, four, there are certain icons that you can use. So if you want to, you can text, uh, you can put in the chat. I usually have a look, but you can also raise your hand. So if you want to speak, please raise your hand, don't just budge in. Uh, when you raise your hand, usually I see uh, a signal and I can call upon you uh, to speak. Obviously after speaking, it's important that you put down your hand and uh, by that, I mean using, raising the hand icon in Zoom and not, you know, you physically raising your hand because if your video is off, then anyway, I won't see you. Uh, Pamela, please unmute. Uh, sorry, mute yourself. Um, I think pretty much that's it. I see 77 students and I understand that this is probably some people are not aware, but we are going to start teaching. I'm starting teaching today and I will continue to teach on Zoom uh, for some time. Now me teaching on Zoom does not mean that people dodge the class. It is not, first of all, if you dodge the class, you're likely to get a retake, I, I can assure you. But it's also not great that you're dodging. Even if you're, you know, you are a superstar, which I doubt uh, until you've proven it. Please attend all lectures. I will be giving videos, recorded videos of the class to you for your usage, but that's not uh, so that you can miss the lectures. I am not um, obligated to give you the videos. It is totally my choice. So if I notice that so many people are dodging the lectures, then I'm not going to give you my videos. But if most of you are coming, then that's okay. My point is that if you're not helping yourselves, I'm not obligated to help you. Nobody can force me to give you the video. Obviously, I'm going to give you a reference book. I don't give you my slides. I don't think it's necessary for me to give you my slides. Uh, so I give you the reference book because my slides really are based on that reference book, uh, just one. I don't use any other book, I just use uh, the one book. We are going to be doing a number of assignments, a number of uh, uh, labs uh, within this lecture, uh, or with, at least with me, you, you know you also do labs with the uh, technicians, that, that's separate from what I do. But obviously, for me, I do my labs, software-based labs as part of my assessment, but they also do hardware-based labs and they give me marks. So the marks they give me, I just uh, give them to you as they are. 
But please note that I also do my own uh, lab assessment and mine are purely software based. Finally, for those software based labs, we are going to be doing them in groups. Okay, so we are going to be doing them in groups. And usually I create groups of four, five, at most six students. And I like to mix you up. So make sure that on each team, there is at least somebody from a different class or a different, um, uh, a different uh, course. Because the people here, I believe, are electrical, telecom, and biomedical, as far as I know. So make sure that your group has somebody from each one of those uh, three classes. Uh, I'm not saying go form groups, but please start to think about it. So that when I say bring groups, some of you have already formed your groups. You will not believe it, but we, we, I give assignments and people are handing in and some people come and say they do not have groups. Uh, I'm not going to accept those excuses this time because clearly I've told you right at the beginning of the, um, of the class. The other excuse I usually get with groups is that people say we can't find somebody from this class or that class. Please, I'm sure you can. And uh, I, I would say right now that you should form groups of at least of five people, not six, five people. Um, and if you have a very good reason why you cannot find somebody from a certain class, I could understand if you can't find somebody from biomedical engineering, uh, for instance but you cannot fail to find somebody from telecom or from electrical, surely. Okay, with that introduction, I'm going to remove my video and share my notes and we can start. But let me just see uh, what is... Yes, I agree that the, the slides are useful. I think this is um, uh, a query, yeah, a query. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you that the slides are, are useful, but not. The slides are already in uh, your video that, that I'm going to give you if, if, if I give it to you, of course. But also, I just take snippets of the book. I don't like take out details. So really, my slides don't have much information, honestly. Uh, but also importantly, I don't want people to be reading the slides and forget about the book, okay? Now, this is a course that you can pass uh, with an A, okay? I've had people score 96% in this course, even in the third year course, which I also teach uh, called Applied Digital Electronics. But this is also a course where people score 20%, 15%, uh, 30%. So, it is a course that is really very easy to pass, but also very easy to fail. And everyone will tell you that. So I really I ask you guys to attend uh, the, the, class, the classes and also, you know, work hard. Try to read through the book. Yes, we cover a lot of material, but try to read through the book. The concepts are really easy, but if you don't get them, it is a sure retake, uh, almost as the <laughs> as day follows night. Okay, with that small introduction, uh, I hope that um, uh, now you have seen how I look like. It's not really important, uh, but if we remain on Zoom, then really you may not have another chance perhaps to, to see me. Um, okay, great. And of course, as you are in first year, I, I wish you well. You are. You are here, to, please do mean business. Some of you will, will live with first class degrees. Others will probably not uh, live with the rest because they still have a number of retakes. When you are in first year, uh, you still have a choice. You can choose uh, what you want to happen to you. So I pray that you choose to uh, work hard and, and hope you don't have to get a first class degree. Uh, necessarily, but at least try and uh, do your best. Okay, so I've shared my, my notes. Um, I have this thing that I use uh, to write. So my online lectures are not, 
I'm just not talking. I'm also writing. It's similar to being on, on in a classroom and I have a board. So um, I hope that that helps you to understand better rather than just me being seated here and talking uh, about electronics. Right. Now, digital electronics, basically, in general, anything that, uh, you know what is electronics, okay? Anything that uses some electrical power uh, is electronic, essentially. So your phone is electronic, the computer is electronic, um, your watch, perhaps, depending on what type of watch you have is electronic. If you have a digital watch, for sure, it's electronic. Some watches might be purely mechanical. Uh, your car is an electronic device or gadget because it has a lot of electronics in there. Um, small sensors, are electronics, anything that feeds some electric signal into it and maybe out outputs another electron, uh, electric signal is an electronic device. Now that device might be one of two types. It might be a digital electronic device or an analog electronic device. So that means on one hand you have digital, on the other hand you have analog. And these two uh, are two ways that will represent information. Certainly in the electronics world, we can uh, represent our information as digital or we can represent our information as analog. Uh, that therefore means without saying really that analog is uh, directly opposite of digital. There is no other way we represent information. We can either represent it as analog or we can represent it as digital. So then what is analog representation? Perhaps you know this from your high school, but when we say analog, uh, the characteristic of an analog signal, the overriding characteristic, you know, that one thing that you say, okay, this is analog, is that it is continuous. Okay, it is the signal is continuous and can take on any possible value, okay, uh, value within a given range, okay. So if I tell you that uh, my, um, my signal can range between zero volts, and this is obviously a voltage, so signals can be voltage currents and whatever. Uh, zero volts and five volts, it means that my analog signal can be uh, zero volt, it can be 0 0.1, it can be 0 0.7, it can be 4.2. But even when I look at, say, the range between zero and 0 0.1, in between here, I have almost unlimited possibilities of the values of this of this signal can be 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0, 0 0.000, 000, all of the way, you know, like how far can you stretch it? So that is the idea of analog, that it can take on any possible value within a certain range. Sometimes people say that it can take on a value between zero and infinite, or even negative infinity and uh, positive infinity. That's okay. And I hope that one day uh, I'll describe the idea or the concept of infinity, uh, so to speak. But in general terms, we cannot say that it is hard. You cannot predict. You cannot say that my value is going to be this or that or that. Now, generally, depending on the scales that we use, we can say our, our value is 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5. Okay. Or even if, sometimes if we want, we can say 0, 0 0.5. Uh, 1, 1 1.5 and so on. Imagine for instance that you are using a voltmeter to measure. When you're using a voltmeter to measure for you, your human eye, you, you know, there are certain values that you can read and there are certain values that you cannot read. Please and, uh, mute yourselves. If you're not muted, please mute yourself. Uh, so it shows that for you as a reader, the person reading on the instrument, or you, you can sort of approximate, but really you don't know the exact value because the exact value being analog can be any possible value. Now, digital is different. Uh, the idea of digital is that the signal takes on specific values, okay? 
uh, that means that it is discrete in nature. In other words, if I say that uh, I have my voltage digital uh, voltage signal from zero to five, then I can say that maybe the only possible values of this digital signal are zero, one, two, three, four, five. So my value of digital signal is either zero, but if it rises, it will jump from zero to one. There's nothing in between. And if it jumps from one, and it's rising, it will jump from one to two. There is no point in between, you, it, it just jumps. So it's like a step function. It's at zero, then it jumps to one, then it jumps to two, then it jumps to three, jumps to four, and then finally to five. In other words, as you go through the scale from the minimum to the maximum, there are discrete steps uh, through which your digital signal jumps. It cannot take on any value, for instance, between that or between that or between that. We call this digital and we say that it is discrete. The other thing is that its value is predictable. So you can say that actually um, my value will be either zero or one or two or three or four or five. You know that those are the five uh, choices, zero, one, two, three, four. And, and five, um, you can even have a probability of, you know, if I wanted to guess, I can guess two and I would be probably uh, one, two, three, four, five, maybe six. So around 18 or 17% are correct. I don't know the, the, the probability you can talk about that. So when we call digital, we say, we, when we say digital signals, we mean really that these are discrete signals that go through predetermined or specific discrete steps uh, only, or take on discrete values that are predictable. Now, um, I have some examples of analog and digital signals. I have a 10 position switch. So let's say I have a switch, okay? And I have 10 positions. You know, uh, the switch at home, which we use for switching on the light is a two position switch. You can switch on or off. Okay, so if I have a 10 position switch, is that uh, digital or analog? Uh, I don't know how we do this. Maybe you, you put in the chat, perhaps. Um, okay. Yes, Jethro, it is digital. What about the next one? Current, current flowing through or from an electric outlet through a cable. Is it digital or analog? Yeah. Okay, I see now analog coming through, you're totally right. What about the temperature of a room? Okay, I see a number of analogs, so that is right. Uh, the temperature of a room is definitely uh, analog because although you can use your thermometer to show you 20, 21 degrees really, but the temperature is increasing continuously through uh, those steps. What about sand grains on the beach? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of digital and I agree with you because if I was measuring, you know, it's weird to count <laughs> sand, sand grains on the beach. But if you had to and you were counting, you would count one, two, three, four, you know, putting them on the side, one, two, three, four. So clearly those are digital. Okay, it can be really a large number, like a really huge billions, trillions, perhaps, whatever it is, is beyond that. But it would still be counting through discrete steps of one grain, two grains, three grains, four grains. That makes it uh, digital. What about the automobile fuel gauge, like uh, the fuel gauge in your car? Or the odometer, for instance? 
Okay, yeah, it is analog. Now, if your fuel gauge shows a number, then it's a digital value. But these fuel gauges of ours where you have an arm that is moving some kind of instrument arm that is moving, you know, when you put fuel, it increases and then drops as fuel gets used up. That really is an analog uh, fuel gauge. You've also seen in, um, in some cars, as you drive, your speed increases and you're seeing a number like in the dashboard. Okay, it is uh, 100, 101, 102, 103. Such an a speedometer is digital. Okay, but um, if your speedometer has a spindle arm, like uh, an arm that moves over a scale, uh, like my old car has a, a scale like that, and so there's an arm that keeps moving, that is uh, clearly an analog. Uh, representation of the speed. But if it is digital, then it is it keeps increasing in discrete steps. And usually that the dashboard, the screen will show uh, a number. Somebody unmuted themselves, please mute. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Uh, what about your age? Is it analog or digital? <laughs> I have noticed that most ladies are saying analog, most guys are saying digital. <laughs> anyway, interesting. So this throws it, you know, uh, all over the place because people are not really sure. I think your age is analog. It is as analog as analog can get. Because remember, you are growing or your age is increasing all the time. It's not only on your birthday that you jump. I mean, the, the idea of your birthday is a discrete thing because it happens every one year, you know, you celebrate and so on. But your age is moving. So every second that passes, you know, you are growing. And so that concept of time is a digital is sorry, is an analog uh, representation. But if you are looking at, for example, the watch and it's a, a digital watch and you're looking at the seconds, the seconds keep increasing one, two, three, up to six, and then goes back to one. That is uh, clearly digital. So sometimes, so maybe at this point, I can mention this. Uh, at this point, I can mention that um, the, the world is essentially analog. Nature is analog, uh, time is analog, temperature is analog, pressure is analog, humidity is analog, um, I don't know, force, force is analog, anything that you can think of, light is analog, like the brightness, the uh, contrast, all of these things are analog in nature. Now, when we try to measure them, sometimes we may not be able to pick the real analog values. And so we tend to use digital means to actually measure them. So if you look at the thermometer, this little temperature thermometer that we use maybe when you are sick, you see there is a scale and that scale has lines, of course, and you can see maybe from 36, 36.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4. The thermometer is a digital instrument, technically, because you can read off on a digital scale, but actually, the temperature that it is measuring, for it, it is analog. So that thing, keep, the mercury keeps expanding and that thing keeps moving. But when you are reading, you read it more of a digital scale. So we shouldn't confuse uh, the two. OK. So basically, <laughs> so, so basically we have analog. Um, analog representation and digital representation. When we talk about uh, electronic systems, we talk about analog systems and digital systems. Uh, digital systems manipulate information that is in digital form. Okay, so if my, you know, I have a system and uh, it is a digital system, okay, and I have an output and I have an input and my, my information changes in steps. This is a digital system. 
Okay. Whereas for the analog system, it is also really a bunch, a, a combination of devices, of electronic devices that manipulate information in analog form. For the digital system, you combine devices that manipulate information in digital form. Uh, for analog systems, we manipulate information in analog form. So to speak, you can say that the input into a digital system is a digital uh, signal. Whereas for an analog system, it is an analog uh, signal. The set of, please, somebody is unmuted. Please mute yourself. The set of devices that you combine to manipulate to make up these two systems sometimes can be uh, different. Uh, with digital systems, they can be electronic. Okay, so most we will be focusing on electronic devices here, but they can also be mechanical, they can be pneumatic, they can be magnetic um and so on even analog systems really now we have a number of advantages of digital over analog um i'm just going to go through these you probably already know them uh, digital systems are essentially easier to design as we go through you realize why uh, this is the case but generally it, they are easier to design uh, if you look at for instance this and that uh, another thing is that with the digital systems, you can fabricate uh, significantly on IC chips. The revolution that you see in the world, in, in the world, of course, has been uh, particularly in, uh, in the information world, things like computers, pneumatic is for uh, gas and uh, air pressure. Okay, pneumatic means systems that use air pressure or gas, gaseous uh, pressure. Uh, the, 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 the revolution that you see with mobile phones, with computers, tablets, all of this stuff, now you are, your smartphones, sensors, smart watches, and so on, is of course enabled by the fact that we can fabricate <clears throat> these huge things on very small IC chips. So you, they call it miniaturization, the concept of miniaturization, something that miniature is something that is small, like minute. So you can have a million, one million uh, transistors, for instance, and these are fabricated on a very little small block of uh, substrate, uh, silicon. I think you've seen when, if you look at a circuit board, usually there are those little block, triangular or square uh, black blocks uh, with arms coming out. We call those integrated circuit chips. Okay, I know you people just call them chips. If you look at any dig, even your, even even the flash disk, if you look at the flash drive itself, it has a small chip and usually that's memory and uh, and and other things. So, with the digital systems, we are able to fabricate, you know, millions and millions of these on really very small substrates, and it is possible with analog as well. But the problem is that with analog, there are certain things that we can fa not fabricate in IC chips. Things like big capacitors, big transformers, uh, big tra precision resistors. If you look at, for example, these motherboards, you usually see capacitors there. You know, you should ask yourself, why are they not uh, inside the chips? So, so there is the ease to design digital circuits, but also to produce them. Okay, the, the design is simple and it's also uh, easier to fabricate. Uh, let me see. Yeah, you can, I mean, the ones which use hydraulic systems can, for instance, fall under uh, mechanical, but they can also fall under uh, pneumatic. I think it depends on uh precisely what you're doing but i think mechanical um hydraulic you know hydraulic systems tend to be under mechanical uh engineering as well there is the ease to store information so with the digital systems because you know i am like for instance zero uh to five let's say that i have inputs here okay i have my input here and my output i know it can be either zero or five. So I already sort of know what I expect. Yes, I don't know exactly, but I know what it can be, like uh, chances of what it can be. And that makes it easier to store. As we are going to see, most of these big memories that you see store 
uh, digital information. You can have terabytes now in your, in your hand. You can have a, a small flash drive of uh, 32 GB, 64 GB. Uh, your smartphone probably has 256 GB. Um, uh, if maybe, I don't know if it is, um, and, and if it is an iPhone, maybe 256 GB. Um, a few years ago, getting 256 GB wasn't easy. You could, it would be like a huge thing, but you know, right now, miniaturization means that things are becoming smaller and also easier. So digital information tends to be easier to store because the possibilities are few. We know those discrete values, and so they are really it comes a bit easier to store that information. Also, easy to create the memory uh, to store that information. Um, there is enhanced accuracy and precision. I'm going to explain this in a moment, but uh, basically, what we need to know is that if I'm looking at zero, let's for instance look at a binary system. A binary system has two two values, either a zero or a one. And so we combine this, you know, like in digital system, in the decimal systems, we have zero, one, two, three, all the way to nine. With binary, we have either zero or one. So if I have my input, my input is a voltage that ranges from zero to five. I can say that from that point to that point, this is bit zero, okay? Binary digit zero, and that is a bit one. So the reason why we have enhanced accuracy and precision is because here we are not targeting the actual value. We have a range of values which we can represent using the same thing. And even here we have a range of values which we can represent using the other bit. You see, with the analog system, if my temperature is 20.1, if it goes to 20.2, it is important that I know it goes to 20.3, it is important that I know, but with digital systems, it will go from 20 to 21. Uh, that means that here, whatever happened in here in the middle is not important to me. And so the requirements on precision, the requirements on accuracy and even operations is really reduced with digital systems as opposed to analog systems. With analog systems, small changes in the value actually mean a big deal, which is not the case in digital uh, systems. Uh, the other thing is that operations can be programmed. Uh, for example, your computer. I mean, you can have a set of instructions that tell the digital system uh, what to do. Um, and yeah, you can program analog systems, but it is not that uh, as easy as with the digital. Uh, systems. All this information, by the way, is in the book, so you can read it in depth. The other is that there is reduced, uh, there is less effect of noise on a digital system. Who knows noise? Can you tell me what noise is? What is noise? In a digital, in an in a electronic sense. Well, uh, imagine that you're sending information. Okay, let me see. I'll give you a reference book, a zero. Yeah, essentially it is unwanted signal. So you, let's say I am transmitting a digital signal like that, and I find noise like that. It means that if I add these two, I might end up with, you know, now this increases here and you know, this is the result. And so you need to compare this and that, and they don't really look uh, at all the same. And the other thing, unfortunately, is that we cannot start here and convert back to there because with, um, uh, we don't know the noise. This is the noise. The noise you can't know because it is unpredictable. As you go through this course, not, not, this, pro not this particular course unit, but like your, your degree here, you will begin to appreciate more the concepts around noise. Uh, but generally it is an unpredictable signal that is also unwanted, but we always have it because electronic devices generate it. They, they generate a noise called thermal, thermal noise. Uh, there are also other noises that can be generated as part of 
uh, uh, you know, from other sources, including things like interference, crosstalk, and intermodulation noise. But generally, the one that we want to talk about that is ever present is called thermal noise. It comes from the thermal agitation of electron uh, electrons within uh, or atoms within uh, these electronic devices, as long as there is some heat, right? So. So, so basically with analog signal, if I tell you this, if I show you this, you cannot take me back to that one because you don't know how much noise there was. Now let's look at the case of a digital signal. With the digital, let's say I have level zero and level one, okay? This is zero, this is bit one. Now let's assume that we've added some noise. Maybe now what I have is, you know, you see? So if you look at this signal, surely you can work out that this is a zero and that's a one because of the fact that you have these two levels and nothing in between them. Okay, even if we had five levels or 10 or whatever, it's still easier with the digital system to try and go backwards. So yes, we have a signal that has been affected by noise, but it is very easy to see that actually this is at a certain level and that's at a certain level. And sometimes we make mistakes, of course, like the noise here might have been in too much to raise this to that level. But generally, we can uh, try and work backwards and get our original analog signal. And this is actually what happens in most cases. Uh, every, like for instance, if you're transmitting information through fiber from uh, the East African coast to Europe, there are places where we call, we call those points regenerative repeaters. When the signal reaches there, it is refreshed, it is regenerated. So it comes with a noise and at that point you generate a new fresh digital signal and continue sending it. You cannot do that with analog signal. Let me say we are transmitting from point A to point B. We have our digital signal. By the time it gets to this point, it is now uh, distorted, okay? But we can, you know, this is called a regenerative repeater. But now we can look at this and form a fresh copy and transmit it again. By the time it reaches here, it is distorted again and we can generate a new copy and so on. You, you cannot do that with analog signals because obviously you don't know what, how much noise was or what it was before. You cannot just uh, uh, assume. And this is another regenerative repeater. You can have as many regenerative repeaters as you want. So that is what I mean by uh, it is less susceptible uh, to noise effects. All right. Okay, now finally, what is the limitation? The limitations of digital systems is that the world is essentially analog. And so all the physical quantities or physical phenomena that we are measuring are perhaps analog in nature. So when we, we, when we want to use digital systems, it means we must convert those analog uh, phenomena into a digital form because the digital system needs a digital input. But yet what we are measuring is an analog input. That means we must uh, bring it into, uh, uh, to, to convert it into digital form. Every time we are converting a signal from analog to digital, we lose some accuracy, right? So that conversion uh, reduces some, and I think they teach this in third year. Even me, I, I, I talk about, I think at this stage, maybe it's a bit too early for me to take you through how that is done. But in general terms, every time you're converting a signal from analog to digital, you will lose some information. Not, not information, information, but like some accuracy, some accuracy level. Because usually when we generate that digital system, we process it, but we need to convert it back to analog. And so those, and so we realize that when we convert back to analog, that output analog signal is not similar to the input analog signal. So there is some loss, you know, some quality loss. Some uh, usually the loss is mainly in the shape and so on. We you'll have a chance to study this uh, before you finish the uh, the program. 
uh, but actually it's taught more in communication, uh, I think communication systems. I like to teach it myself because it's interesting, but uh, it is beyond the scope of this course, of this particular course unit. Right, so if we want to work with the digital systems, there are four steps that we must take. First of all, remember the physical quantity we are measuring is analog. It's things like temperature, pressure, you know, force, wind, speed, and so on. So we need to convert this into an electronic signal because remember a digital system is an electronic system. Even an analog system is an electronic system. But if you're measuring wind or rainfall or temperature or pressure, this is not, pressure is not an electronic thing. So you need to convert it into some representative electronic signal. So if I'm measuring temperature, for instance, I can say that for my zero, zero degree centigrade, I will represent it using zero volts. Five degree centigrade, I can represent it using five volts. 20 degree centigrade, I can use um, 20 volts. So that means that each, degree centigrade, you know, each degree centigrade, I should remove this, I represent it using one volt because clearly here, if it was one, it's one, two, two, and so on and forth. We study this concept in third year uh, applied digital electronics. Some of you will not be with us if you are, for instance, in biomedical. Now, um, yes, so, so yeah, so you need to convert that physical quantity into an electronic signal. In other words, get temperature and convert it into a representative value that is electronics, meaning some a quantity like voltage or current or whatever you want to, to call it. Now, let me ask you a question. What kind of instrument would convert a physical quantity into an electronic signal? Let me give you an example, a sensor. A sen like a temperature sensor, you put it in uh, wherever you want to measure the temperature and it gives you a voltage or a current and that current is a representative of the, of the temperature in the real world. So sensors are essentially devices that work at this level. What do they call, what, what would you call that? I don't know if you would know it, but let me just answer it for you. This is called, Yes, yes, Julius. And actually, Julius, I don't know if your other name is iPad, but that's what I was saying, that please put both of your names. I, I see people with I, called iPhones, you know, I just give, give instructions. <laughs> I don't know why you've refused to listen, but uh, you are right that it is a transducer. Okay, a transducer is any uh, equipment or device that converts uh, some th something from one form to another. So we have temperature in one hand, and on the other hand, we have an electronic signal. So clearly, we have a transducer in the middle there. If you think of a signal like in any communication system, wireless communication system has an antenna. So on one hand, you, had, you have an electronic signal going into the antenna, and on the other side, you have an electromagnetic wave moving in free space, in space. We call that antenna uh, uh, um, a transducer as well. A speaker, like a microphone. When you are speaking into a microphone, you're, you're giving sound and the microphone is getting giving an electronic signal. That is a transducer. On the other side, you have a speaker. An electronic signal is going into the speaker. What is coming out of the speaker is sound. That is a transducer and so on and so forth. Now, after we've converted and go to the electronic signal, that electronic signal is usually analog. We need to convert it to digital form so that we can use it in the digital system. For us to do that, we use what we call an analog uh, to digital converter, ADC, okay? And it's just like that. So you have analog, you get digital, right? And that's the name. There's no other more technical name. That's the name of these devices. They convert analog to digital. So we call them analog to digital converters. Now, once we have an analog to digital convert, that means the signal we have now is in digital form. Into the analog to digital converter inputs an analog signal that we've got from our transducer and gets an 
output digital signal. When we now, once we have our digital signal, we can move it into the digital system and manipulate it. We can operate on it. Uh, whatever we are doing with it, uh, it doesn't matter. But after we need to convert it back to analog. Okay, so we convert the digital. You know, you can show it. You can, of course, output it as digital. Okay, and display it as digital. So if I'm doing a speed, like we were talking about speedometer in cars, if I've already got the speed uh, and I want to display it as a digital signal, you know, on a dashboard, then I don't need to convert it analog at all. But if I want to display it on that other scale, which has a, an arm, then I need to convert it to analog and I display it uh, on that sort of scale, that, that semicircular scale. So we have to convert the digital output back to a real world analog and we use a, <laughs> a digital uh, to analog converter. And this is called a DSC or DAC. I just like to call it the DAC. <clears throat> um, now you can obviously now use that to actually convert, you can use another transducer to get that analog output back into the real world. Not all cases require that, obviously. Uh, okay. Let us look at this uh, system, for instance. So here you have set a desired temperature. This is similar to, for instance, when you have a, an AC, AC in your office or home or whatever. Usually you set, it, a, a temperature, a desired temperature, say 20 degrees centigrade. Or, or at home, if you have a thermostat, you set the temperature at a certain 20 degrees centigrade. So this one, you do it in digital. Okay, you input on a keypad or you can use a remote uh, to set your signal to 20 degrees centigrade. That is your desired temperature. Now you have, and actually this now, we can temperature control the space. We can call maybe this a room but this could also be in an industry where you have those uh, tanks or chemical, or whatever processes or whatever is happening. Anywhere, you have this sensor. This sensor is in the space that you are trying to control. So clearly the sensor, sorry, one moment. Okay, I'm back. So clearly the sensor is taking the actual reading of the room where you want to control the temperature. And we have a heater. So this heater is there to increase the temperature. Of course, you could have a fan to reduce the temperature. You could have both as well, really. But this is clearly a temperature regulating uh, digital system. So anyway, you take the sensor. So let's say we have put 20 degrees centigrade here. You take, you have your sensor, it measures this to be uh, 15 degrees centigrade. This is uh, uh, a sensor we have an analog signal as we have seen that represents this 15 degrees centigrade. And this analog signal is electronic. Okay, because the sensor I said is a transducer. So you transmit this and find an analog to digital converter. It converts this electronic signal that represents 15 degrees centigrade to digital. So you have a digital value here. Maybe the digital value here comes and says, oh, we have 15 degrees centigrade. <clears throat> this digital processor, which is where we were talking about you manipulate, okay? This digital processor compares, might compare this and that. I don't know what it does or how it does it, but this is just an example. So it might get 20 degrees, subtract 15 and find five degrees centigrade. And this difference, is to tell the heater that, oh, we need to increase the heat. It can even give it more information like how much, you know, how much should you increase the heat? Uh, and so that goes out, <clears throat> it goes through, because it's a digital signal, it goes through a digital analog converter and that analog signal, analog electronic, remember it is still also now analog electronic, similar to this, goes into the heater 
and tells the heater that you should increase the temperature uh, or you should increase your the voltage into the heater by this so that temperature can increase fast. Uh, and, and at some point when the sensor senses 20 degrees centigrade, and it comes and here now the difference here is zero degrees centigrade, that zero might be converted and whatever that signal is there that represents zero might tell the heater to shut down, all right? You know, shut down because now there's no difference between the temperature we have set and the temperature that we want. So, so yeah, so that is uh, an example of analog representation vis-a-vis -vis digital representation and analog vis-a-vis -vis, uh, digital uh, systems and how they operate. So I will reiterate or I can re-emphasize that the nature is inherently analog but we tend to work with digital systems because of the advantages that we talked about. So what that requires is that first of all, we measure, we get an analog equivalent of the physical phenomena. We convert it to digital. After that, we can manipulate that digital signal, but we need to convert it back to analog so that it can make sense to whoever is reading it. Obviously, let's look at a, a, an example before I go to the guys that are in the chat. If I'm speaking, into a microphone that is my, let's say uh, a, a phone like LTE, LTE or 4G, 5G, these things you talk about, these are digital systems, even GSM is a digital system. So when you speak, your sound is analog, okay? But the, 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 the mouth, the, what you call mouthpiece is really a microphone in your phone it receives your sound and converts it into electronic. So that makes it a transducer. Now, when it converts it to electronic, there is an analog to digital converter that converts it to digital in your phone. And then your phone sends it through the digital network. When, it, when you are receiving that signal will come as a digital, but it is converted to analog. And then the analog signal is put into the earpiece. The earpiece, what you call the earpiece is a, um is a um is like a speaker it's like how you have these uh, speakers that we play music uh, with so it converts it into sound and so that also makes that speaker a transducer and then you are able to hear the sound but uh, if you are if whatever information came from there was supposed to be displayed so that you can read it off a screen then you don't need to transduce it you can just display it in digital in digital form. Let me see what's in the chat. Do percolators have sensors? <laughs> uh, Duff, that's a good question. I think it depends on what percolator you're using, but most percolators are actually <clears throat> pneumatic in the sense that when you boil, it, uh, it, um, it the, the, the gas, you know, that steam, increases and I think sometimes it's the one that, okay, it is the one that trips uh, the percolator to go off. That's one. But clearly your percolator can also have a sensor. So I can ask you to design a digital system that can work nicely with the percolator to trip it off uh, when the temperature has reached. And by the end of this course, that will be a very simple uh, thing to design. So don't worry about it. <clears throat> But no, with the percolator, the heat does not increase because of the, pro no, the percolator for it, obviously, it has a heater. So for it, you just apply voltage or you plug it into the, elect uh, the electricity. It heats up that coil. It will heat up until uh, the heat, the, the, the steam forces it to switch off or whatever other system you have. We call that, um, I don't think it, these uh, simple percolators have sensors, no to be specific to your question. But what I'm saying is that it is possible to design a digital signal, a digital system around that. Just give me a moment. Uh, Hisham, 
uh, or, or Imran, uh, I think. Uh, guys, don't, don't send direct messages to me. Please send to everyone so that everyone can see what we are talking about, okay? I've just seen that some people are do, doing DM, direct message. So Duff was asking, so do percolators have sensors? Imran is asking, how is the analog to digital conversion error rectified? It is, uh, it cannot be fully rectified, but it can be minimized. So at the point of converting, you can minimize it. Let me just give you a sneak preview into how the whole conversion takes place. So let's say I have my digital signal like that. I can say that my analog signal, this is analog. I can say that from this level to that level, I will call it uh, zero, you know, like bit zero or like zero, zero. From that level to that level, I'll call it zero, one. From that level to that level, I'll call it one, zero. And from that level to that level, I'll call it one, one. But I can also say that from this level to that, you know, instead of having four levels, one, two, three, four, I can have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so now I have zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, one. And so any analog signal within here is called zero, zero. <clears throat> so you can see there is a, a, long, a large area of approximation to the same thing. Whereas here it has reduced, but what is different is that now I have three, three bits for each level. So if you want to increase the accuracy, you need to reduce those gaps of approximation, but the cost is that you now need more bits to represent them. Don't worry too much about this. We are going to reach a point where we are combining a number of bits to create one thing that means the same, but we'll get there. For now, it's because you are asking me questions that are still a bit ahead, but this is actually how we convert analog to digital. We create this, we divide it into equal steps and each step is given a certain digital value, but obviously in a chronological increasing order. And we call this quantization uh, because we are creating quantities, you know, specific quantities. So you shouldn't worry too much about this because this I think is really third year uh, or second year, but, but this is essentially. And so you can see him run here that if we, now if I got this and actually did 16, you see, now the area of approximation is reducing, meaning that I don't have those large inaccuracies. Because you see here, if a, if a value is here and another one is there, I say that it is the same, but really it is too big. But if I reduce that one and then that one, now at least this one would be in a different range, which makes it more accurate. Now here, if I'm doing 16 levels, I have zero, 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 all the way to one, 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 one. So we are going to get there. Uh, let me see, do these conversions apply to fiber optics? And I think that is um, another DM um, by Segawa. Um, they can, yeah, it depends, but they, they can because uh, optics really you're transmitting light and light is analog as you know. No, Vivian, if you're speaking to somebody directly, that is not an electronic system. There is no electro, you know, you are just using your God given ears or sense of, of hearing uh, to listen to their person. So the ear listens to analog sound. And so you can just speak, you know, that means your ear also has like, a, <laughs> I don't know, a transducer, I don't know, <laughs> maybe converting sound into some electronic signals that go into your brain. But uh, no, first face, no. But every time there is a electronic communication, then of course it can also be purely analog. You can do communication without converting anything to digital. Like these uh, old telephone were all analog. And also the first generation, you know, we say 4G, 3G, 4G, 5G, you hear these things, of course, now. <clears throat> but if there is 3G, 4G, 5G, it means there is 2G, and 2G is still here, GSM. But there is also clearly 1G, first generation of telecommunications or mobile telecommunications. Those were also purely analog. There was no need for digital conversion. But the point is that we now know that digital systems are good 
because of the advantages that we saw. And so we would rather do our work in digital, but that requires that we convert uh, back and forth. Right, let me see Julius, they have a biometrics, okay. Uh, I will stop that. Um, okay, is a thermostat a transducer? Yes, or at least the thermostat is bigger than a transducer, but it does all of that within that. It's a big uh, digital system that includes uh, a sensor, temperature sensor, and, uh, and uh, you need to transduce because you are looking at temperature, you need to convert it to electronics. So really you need to, in fact, anything that is electronic, but measuring something that uh, is physical really needs a transducer. And so transducers are, 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 are more common than you can imagine. Now with thermostat also, because it regulates, you know, it also uh, has another transducer at the other side. So like if I'm going to regulate, maybe by switching on the AC, I need to send a signal to the, uh, to the AC. And then when you, when you have a scenario like this, where now you have a, a heater, you know, you send a signal to a heater and the heater change uh, switches on or off by switching on or off you are changing the physical phenomena that you were measuring and so when we go we, when we act on the physical phenomena we call that actuation okay so if i measure the temperature and determine that i should switch on the ac i'm actuating because the ac is going to change the phenomena that i'm trying to control and so basically when we 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 usually we teach sensors, we usually say sensors and actuators. These tend to go together. Actuators are things that change the physical phenomena. So things like heaters, um, bulbs like light, like I can switch on the light or switch it off. You know, if I leave the room, if I have my digital system, it can automatically sense that I've left. So the sensing is to say that I've left. And then the actuation is to switch off the lights. You've seen these uh, automatic switching uh, systems. <clears throat> or you are approaching a big door or a hotel or a garage at home and it opens itself. Stuff like this uh, are, are all actually actuators. But you need to first sense before you actuate. Uh, please uh, unmute yourselves, Kawoya, Charles. Please, un uh, please mute yourself. There's this person of 19 stroke U22, 169 PSA. I said at the beginning that when we join the class, we should use our actual names. Uh, it is important. It's also just good manners, actually. Because now, who are you? What if you are not supposed to be here? By the way, I should tell you that do not share this, this link with anybody that is not a member of our class. Please, this is like really being professional. Uh, this link is our link and so should be with only people who belong to this class. Do not try to excite your cousins by inviting them into uh, our lecture. We, we mean serious business. Okay. Um, well, no, to, to convert AC to DC, isn't the format the same? It is still an electronic signal. So the form is the same. So you really don't need an actuator, but to convert, analog uh, AC to DC, we use, I think we use an rectifier. That really is not uh, a transducer because it's really the same. It's an electronic signal, okay? Uh, you're not converting a form of energy. Um, is a signal antenna a transducer? Yes, I, I just said this that, you know, you have, uh, you, you know, let's say this is your antenna. This is, you have, here you have electronic signal. <clears throat> it is electronic because it is going through a wire. And here you have uh, electromagnetic uh, wave. So these are two different forms and they, that they make a trans, uh, an antenna a transducer. Somebody is asking, is it a ADC or, or is it an ADC? Well, transducers are not ADCs or, or DACs, no. 
um, you know, with the, with ADC, you have a, a digital signal you want to convert it to. You have an analog signal to convert to digital. And so an ADC is just a converter of one form of the same form of energy, really. It's just changing the representation. It's not a transducer. Okay. Thanks for those questions. I like to have a discussion with the class. So because it is our first class and we started a bit late, I'm going to continue teaching. Usually I give a small break, but um, again, no, uh, Musa. <laughs> we don't use an analog to digital converter um, to convert AC to DC. Because I think you are trying to say that AC is analog and DC is digital, but it is not. DC can also be analog. Okay. DC, just because it is a value that is not, you know, it is like two volts, two volts can be an analog value because it could be 2.00101, you know, something like that. <laughs> ah, gentlemen. Jordan Magara, how come you, let me see. Let me see if I can unmute you all. Okay. So I'll continue teaching. Now in, in future classes, I'll be giving you a break, okay? Just a short 10 minute break in the middle because I know uh, focusing on Zoom for 10 minutes uh, is not easy, but I'll be giving you uh, breaks in future. Another thing is that in future, I might choose to give, um, I might choose to give a poll, like a, an assignment, a quiz within, and I use Zoom. Now, the past in the past when I did it, some students told me that they were used sharing the same device. Okay, so maybe I see a hundred people here but maybe 140 are attending but some are sharing devices in future when i want to give a poll i'll tell you so that each one can use their own device because everyone has to answer on their own and then i, I record that information somewhere but anyway and of course then it is very critical that everybody shows your name because i want to know you by you know you are you are you are you are whatever name I'll give the reference book to, to you guys. Uh, this morning, Jesse uh, contacted me and uh, I'll be setting up Muere, a Muere account, and that's where I usually put the reference book. So I'll put the reference book and then I will share a code for you guys to join in and you can find the book there. Now, this is very easy. Everybody knows this because this is actually P4, P5, the decimal system. Decimal system is where we count use numbers between zero and nine. And this is the one that human beings use. So 99, uh, 14, 7, 6, 7, 1, 0, 8, 7, 9, whatever number we write, we must use a combination of digits that range from zero to nine. When we do that, we have by decimal a system. When we have a number like 1078, this is called the least significant digit, okay, LSD, and this one is the most significant digit. Now you people know this because this is like, uh, <laughs> um, you, you did this in P4, P5, and you guys were recently in P4, P5. So I am not going to, to, to teach you uh, how to count in decimal systems. But you know that each number here has a weight and the weight is a position, position of value. So a number that is on the left has a bigger weight than a number that is on the right. And those numbers are expressed as powers of 10. So to speak, decimal system uses uh, base 10. So if we have a number like this, a number like this, we have, I, I see, um, yeah, these are ones, tens, you know, those things, hundreds, thousands, these are the things. And this side, tenth, hundred, thousand, and so on. This becomes the most significant digit. This becomes the least significant digit. And so 
if we wanted to get the actual value, we can say 2 times 10 to the power 3 plus 7 times 10 to the power 2 plus 4 times 10 to the power 1 plus 5 times 10 to the power 0, which we know as 1. Then for after the decimal, we start the tenth hundreds and so on. So this becomes time two times ten to the power neg one plus one times ten to the power neg two plus four times ten to the power neg three. Now where this helps us is on the counting because um, you can find out you can find out what that difference is. Let's let's move on Buhari. Uh, so you see here, you count from zero to one. When you reach nine, you come and pick this number and then start going through this range again. When you reach 19, you now come and pick that number and go through the same range again, which is 20 to 29. When you reach 30, you come and uh, when you reach 29, you come and pick a three and go through the same range again, so on and so forth. And so that's what we continue to do. And this is important because that's also how we count in other uh, systems. Let us look at the next most important system, which is the binary system. It is base two. That means it has two possible values. Here we have 10 possible values, which we call, which, we, which is why we call this the decimal system anyway. Zero to nine are 10 values. With base two, we have two values. And in, in binary systems, we have a binary value zero and a binary value one. We call this bits, okay? Bit zero, bit one. Bit is a binary digit, okay? So that is actually where it comes from. B, I, and T, a bit. Now, if I'm counting from, if I'm counting in binary, okay, so if I have a number like uh, one, 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 zero, one, this is my least significant bit, or I can call it digit, but with the digits, you know, binary digits, we just call them bits. So it's okay to say LSB. And here I have my most significant bit or most significant binary digit. Uh, this is important and we are going to continue using this concept through our course unit, but generally we need to know that what is on the left is more significant that one, than what is on the right. Uh, again, weights here are based on positional value and here we use powers of two. So like here, if we have this number and we want to convert it to decimal, we just say that this is one times two to power three plus zero times two to power two, we know that is zero, plus one times two to power one, plus uh, one times two to power zero. By the way, that's eight, that's zero, that is uh, two, that's one. Plus one times two to power minus one, that's 0 0.5, plus zero, okay, so we have a zero there, plus, one times two to the power minus three, which is one over eight, which I think is 0 0.125. So here you have eight, 10, 11, 11.625. 11 to the base of 10, okay? So this value, which is 1011.101 in base two is equivalent to 11.625 in base 10. Now, when we are counting, with this one, the counting is very interesting. So we have, let's count, but the problem with this is that it has just two bits. So we have zero and one. Now for the next one, we come back and pick zero. Uh, okay, we have like, uh, we have zero and zero one. So the next time we want to count after one, we have to get um, this, this one, we make it one and go through this same again, one, zero, and then one, one. But generally, it is not as complicated as it looks, but usually the best way is to first determine the range through which you want to count. Let me say I want to count uh, 50. No, that's a lot, let's use something simpler. Let's say I want to count 10 items. If I want to count 10 items, I find a tooth power whatever that is greater or equal to 10. 
So if I use two to the power three, that's eight. Eight is not greater than 10. That means if I put four, this is 16, which is greater than 10, which is okay. So it means I need <clears throat> to combine four bits. So I can say zero, 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 zero. Now the next value here is the first, the one that goes, that changes by one in this least significant bit, which is zero, 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 one. If we use this one, you can see that everything is zero until one times two to the power zero, giving me one. Now, for me to get to, this is equal to zero clearly. This is equal to one. For me to get two, okay, the equivalent of two is if you use this same method of position of value, <clears throat> I will have zero, zero, one, and zero. This one is really, this one becomes two times one, to power one and that is you know two to power one to power one is two so i have two what if i want three i will have zero zero one one and so now i have one one which is two to power times times one to power one plus <clears throat> is it no it is one actually it's one times two sorry guys sorry about that one times two to power one <clears throat> sorry plus one times two to power zero and so this will give me two plus one, which is three. If I want four, I'm going to, you see now I'm going to increase the next one, which is zero, one, zero, zero. If I want five, I will say zero, one, zero, one. Okay, so I'm keeping, I keep increasing by one and I'm looking at specific positions. The next one will be zero, one, but now I need to increase this and make that a zero and then zero, one, one, one. And this is going to be seven, obviously six, five and so on. And you can continue until you have one, 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 which gives us uh, 15 actually. So it will be from zero to 15, giving us 16 possibilities. One, 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 like this one is one times two to power three plus one times two to power two plus one times two to power one plus one times two to power zero, that's eight plus that's four plus that's two plus one which is 15. So 15 is one, 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 one. <clears throat> so here I'm asking, what is the largest number that can be represented using six bits and eight bits? Just take one second uh, to write it down for me. You first start with the six bits. What is the largest number or largest decimal number that can be represented using six bits? We have just seen that if we are using four bits, we can represent 15. Just take a second and type for me in the chat for six bits. Yes, Jethro, that's good. And for eight bits, I know there are some people who are lost. I'll be with you soon. Right, so yeah, thank you guys, but it is 255 to be specific. So with six bits, a largest in, in digital systems, in binary systems, with whatever number you are, whatever number of bits you are given, 
the least value is where everything is zero. That's zero, 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 zero. If you use this, these are six bits, then you are going to get a zero. Uh, and so the, if I have six bits, the range of values that I can write is or, or, re, or count is from 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Now, if I want to find the largest number, this is the least number, this is the biggest number I can count using six bits. Everything is in between. So this would be two times, no, one times two to power five, okay? Plus, because the position of this, if I have one, 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 that is two to power zero, two to power one, two to power two, two to power three, two to power four, two to power uh, five. Uh, plus one times two to power four, plus one times two to power three, plus one times two to power two, plus one times two to power one, plus one times two to power zero. So that's a one, two, four, eight, sixteen. Uh, 32. If you add up this, you'll get uh, 63. And uh, for eight bits, we would be adding here basically one times two to power seven plus one times two to power six. And this is 64. This is 128. So if we add up everything, we are going to get to uh, five, five. Now you realize that <clears throat> When we are dealing with binary systems, we use powers of two. So it is basically 128, 256, uh, 64, 32, 16, you know, so and so on and so forth. Even when you look at your memory, sometimes it tends to follow the same uh, nomenclature. So you'd hear 128 GB, you'd hear 64 GB, you'd hear 32 GB for your flash, you'd hear 8 GB you'd hear 4GB. You never hear uh, 5GB. You really don't. You never hear that uh, your memory has 200GB. <laughs> you know, you never hear that. And even when they say 1MB or 1 terabyte, it is usually 1024, uh, whatever times 10 to power, whatever the terabyte is. Uh, or, 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 or at least if we look at one m or one kilobyte, it is not because kilo we know is a thousand, so it's really not one thousand bits. It's usually one zero two four bits, but one zero two four is we know is uh, two to power ten. So most of these things we express them in powers of two because we are dealing with uh, binary. Uh, we are dealing with binary systems. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, Mark. Mark. Now, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, when we, we talk, they say we have talked, but you, you guys are also in this class now. Where is this student, you think? And wherever he is, is he really studying? Wherever he is, is he really studying? Hmm? So it's a very difficult problem. Uh, but, but anyway, those are the ones who will get retakes. Me, I don't mind. Or year mark. Yes, so the 255 and 63, are in decimal, they are like the decimal equivalent of these uh, digital uh, binary values. So if I give you uh, one, 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 it's decimal equivalent is two, five, five, okay? Now, because of us humans, we like to look at things in decimal. And so we tend to convert the, <clears throat> the um, uh, analog value, sorry, the digital value into, sorry, the binary value into uh, a, digit, a decimal value that we can easily understand. But the computer uh, obviously takes it, you know, the computer looks at one, 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 one. It's only us who want to see, uh, to read the equivalence of that in, uh, in decimal. Now you need to remember that six bits are nothing to a computer. A computer can combine 128 bits to make one, 
one value for it it's big but if i showed you a stream of 128 bits you cannot even begin to make sense of them but if I've, a computer converts them for you into a decimal equivalent then you can see a value and then you understand it as a human there might have been why does ram defy you can find a 3gb <laughs> really I don't know. You should do. You should remember. You should. You should. Um, you should look at it critically because I've never seen. Usually, most of these things go uh, in terms of the binary. Okay, powers of two. Um, the list number is always zero. Whether it is a hundred zeros following each other, the list number is always zero because if you use this you always get zero zero times two to power whatever is zero okay so we have about yeah another few minutes another few minutes before we end the class so if we want to represent binary quantities i've already talked about this is that we look for a range that represents binary zero and the other big the other rest of the range represents binary one this is actually a real thing it is ttf we have some type of devices called transistor transistor logic ttf for them if you want to generate a binary zero you need to feed in you know so you have something like this if i feed in a value of between zero to 0 0.8 you know this one will this is a digital system we'll convert it to zero volt, so or binary zero, bit zero. And if it is zero, no, no, if it is two to five, it will convert it to, it will take it as uh, bit one. Now there is this invalid voltage, you know, those are not used for bits. But uh, at this point, at this point, I can say that they are never generated, but actually in reality, sometimes we use them they are called the tri-states okay so we don't really use them when we are dealing with uh, actual data but there are certain cases where you may want to generate a value in this range we are going to see applications of this towards the end of the course but for now let us take it that there is a range of zero bit and a range of five bit and that range in the middle between them is not is not used so the, the issue is that if I gen so this is why digital systems are good actually because I don't need care about the accuracy okay you I can generate two volts I can generate 3.5 volts I can generate uh, 4.8 volts all of these are going to be binary one okay so that is the beauty with uh, digital system that the precision on the input is not so critical as long as your input is within the, the desired range. And then this is called the timing diagram. It basically shows how the signal is changing in time. So between T0 and T1, you have binary one, then go binary zero, then it goes to one to zero. T3 to T4, it is one, T4, T5, it remains and one and so on. So we are going to be working a lot with uh, this. So for instance, I could give you that I have a digital system, it has something called logic here, and I have an input, and I have an output, and I say draw for me out, you know, timing diagram of the output. Output. And so then here you can tell me, you know, okay, how it is changing with respect to time. And this logic, I think, is what I'm about to describe. Why do the values always have to stop at five? Since the input range is represented by one bit, does that also mean that the output will be the same? Indeed, the output will be the same. So at the output, if the value out is uh, between two and five, it will be given to you as bit one. If it is between zero and 0 0.8, it will be given to you as bit zero. And for the first question, why do values have to stop at five? Here we are with the digital systems, we usually use the range zero to five volts we usually use the range zero to five volts. So the, you know, the, 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 the high power is five volts and zero is the ground and everything is in between there. But it shouldn't, it doesn't mean that it always stops at five. We have cases where we have 12.5 volts. We have cases where we even have a higher than 12.5 volts, okay? 
uh, even just above. And you've seen also probably uh, you have seen cases where our highest input, okay, and down here is V is, is ground, but the highest is at 3.3 volts. So we use zero to five because it is the commonest range, particularly with these digital systems. But if you see any other case, do not be confused. So for if if I was stopping at zero and 3.3 volts, I might say that maybe from 1.8 to 3.3 is bit one. And from zero to 0 0.8 is bit uh, zero. Something like that. Uh, uh, Cuthbert, more on invalid volt voltages. Invalid voltages, we have something in a digital systems that we call try state because you can see these are the states. If I say the state of, a, of the output is zero, for instance, I can also say it is low. Low means zero, high means one. And so if I say the, the state, the output is in a state zero or st on, in a raw state, I mean that it has a zero output. If it is in a high state, it has a one output. But we have a, a scenario we call try state. Try is three, okay? So that means that there is a third state in which the output can be. It can be either high or it can be low or it can be in this range, which we call, actually this try state, that third state is called high Z. Z is impedance, so we have high impedance. Okay, sometimes we can generate high impedance at the output so that no, nothing comes out of it. We use this when we start putting together a number of circuits. And so you might have two circuits feeding the same cable and you want to make sure that only one is able to feed it at, at a point, not all of them simultaneous because then they will interfere. When we do that, we can use the third state. So it is a very delicate state that we don't use all the time, but we can use. But I think at this point, it is important that you just take zero and one. When the time comes and we introduce tri-state, you'll be able to uh, include it in your understanding. Again, Oketa, this wouldn't now come up. With a, with a tri-state, you wouldn't ever, see, you, you won't ever see a, a timing diagram for requiring you to represent uh, the high Z state. Now, digital logic, what is logic? You know, logic is how you interpret things. So in digital systems, we have what we call logic. And this logic gives either re releases a value of zero. It is the logic that creates the state of the output. And so depending on what the inputs are, they go through some manipulation and we get an output that is either zero or one. Of course, it can also be high Z, but for now, let's leave that one. Now that manipulation is controlled by the logic of the digital circuit. Uh, so for instance, I could say that when I put uh, my input, let's say I have logic here and my output, let's say V in, V out, okay? If V in, is above uh, two, V out is five volts. If V in is between zero and 0 0.8, V out is equal to zero volt. So it's, it just really means that whatever I've put in, as long as it's between zero and 0 0.8, my output is zero volt. And I can even say bit zero. But even bit zero is represented by a voltage anyway. So, you know, it, it is all electronic. If my voltage input is above two volts, then my output is the full. Even if it was the input was 2.1, the output just goes straight to five. That is logic. It is how the, the circuit, this circuit here has been designed to interpret the input and it gives you a certain output based on that logic. Uh, all electronic circuits, or digital circuits use logic. That is how they know what to do. Um, that is how they know what to do. And so in this course, we'll be involved in the business of creating logic for different circuits so that we can perform certain uh, functionalities. So you can see here, for example, you have a digital circuit. 
Here, the voltage is, when it is zero, the output V0 is four volts. When it goes to five volts, the output here is zero volt. That shows you that this is how it has been designed. If we look at this case, the input is 0 0.5 volts, but the output is 3.7 volts. Whereas on the V out, when the V in is 0 0.5, the output is four. Same as that, much as that was zero and this is 0 0.5, but the output is the same. That is the logic. It says that if the thing is within this range, give me this output and so on and so forth. Uh, let me also, I, I just have a couple of slides before I end this lecture. Let me look at parallel and serial transmission. Uh, we have scenarios where we perform, you know, for instance, if you're using ethernet, in ethernet, if you've ever crimped um, uh, an RJ45 connector for your ethernet cable, you know that you have, I think there are eight wires color coded and you design, you, you, you crimp them based on some color codes. That color coding, that, that is, means that signals are, trans, are being moved through different cables or the eight cables are supposed to be transferring information. So that is really parallel trans, transmission where you have data that moves in parallel. Let's say I have in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have, maybe bits one zero one one zero zero one these are eight are these eight and another one and these are eight okay so all together they are eight bits now if i have eight lines as you can see you have a computer here and you have a printer here if i have eight bits to transmit from the computer to the printer i can move each bit through its own line and meaning that i've transmitted them all together if my rate was one bit per second, it means that I will use one second to transmit all these eight bits because remember each one can move it on its own line so they can all go within the same second. When we are using parallel, we have got to do it differently. So we first transmit this in, sorry, when we are doing serial, serial is like series, we are transmitting things in, series so we first transmit the first bit followed by the second one the third one the fourth one the fifth one the sixth one the seventh one the eighth one and so because each is taking one second i will end up here i've used one second here i'll end up using eight seconds because each one is moving at its own time and so whereas in the parallel transmission we can use a shorter time we need many lines to transmit those that information simultaneously in the serial transmission we need just one line because each each all of them are sharing that one line but then the cost is that we will take more time to transmit so the transmission the trade off is one of speed versus circuitry if we want high speed we better use parallel transmission. If we know, if we don't care so much about the speed, but we are concerned about the complexity of the circuitry, then we can use um, parallel transmission where we can reduce the number of lines. If you've ever opened a computer, like a desktop, you've seen those things we call buses that connect the motherboard uh, to the to the memory, to the external hard disk or auxiliary hard disks. Those are called, uh, those buses really typically are parallel transmission. And so parallel transmission will usually be used where the distance of transmission is short. Okay, so you don't spend too much time transmitting. But if you're transmitting information over a long distance, really long distance, you want to use uh, serial because you don't want to lay many cables over a long distance. But for short distances, we tend to use parallel because the material involved will not be uh, too much. Okay, and then finally, the parts of a computer. A computer really manipulates, it performs arithmetic operations. It manipulates data in whatever way you want, uh, use it in binary form, but it, it has logic, a computer has logic, and then it helps you to make decisions based on the output. So a computer in fact is the biggest and most complex uh, uh, digital electronic device by far. 
Now, the first computers were the size of a football pitch, but right now you can have a computer in your pocket, okay? Your, your phone is essentially a computer. So in a computer system, as you can see this block diagram, we have three main parts. We have the arithmetic and logic unit. We call this ALOU, arithmetic and logic unit. We have the control unit and we have memory. These are really the three main parts. Now, when we combine ALOU and control, we, we form what we call the central processing unit. And then memory is usually outside of that, but we have an input into a computer and an output into a computer. The output is usually displayed on the monitor or the, uh, or the display, you know, okay, at the screen, or it can, the output can be sent to a printer and they print and so on. Whereas the input is how you input information into the computer. So that is really the keyboard and any other way you transmit information into the computer. Uh, you may even have an auxiliary memory like hard disk, and that's where your information that goes into the computer is. Usually the memory that we see here, this memory stores instructions and um, yeah, it stores instructions and uh, generally it is where, it stores instructions that help the computer to perform its work, but it is also where outputs from the arithmetic and logic unit are kept before they are displayed. Uh, the control will get instructions from the memory and transmit them to different parts of the computer. So it can tell the input do this, it can tell the output do this, or it can send those same instructions uh, to the arithmetic and logic unit to perform certain functionalities. Again, all of this, all of this information is within the book and so you should try and read through uh, before we meet next time. Uh, but I'll stop here for today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, you can ask next time. But for today, uh, let's stop here. Uh, have a nice day, and I think we'll meet again this week. Okay. Uh, bye. Now, uh, before yeah, I'll be I'll be putting videos up uh, for this the the people who need them. Uh, as I said, I'll not be giving the notes because the notes are already, the, the slides are displayed within the videos. But also, as you can see, my notes don't have much in them. There isn't much there, but I'll give you a reference book. So please uh, use the reference book to read from there. Uh, have a nice uh, day and see you soon.